this first session is going to be the the poster lightning talks. Uh, it's kindly sponsored by the the UKRI, uh, and they're also providing a uh, hundred pounds cash poster prize for the winner of the best poster competition. Um, so it's very much uh, very appreciated. Thank you to them. So this is a very tight session. We've got fifteen speakers who are each giving a strict two minute timed uh, lightning talk about their poster. Uh, in order to keep sure they stick to two minutes, what will happen is with 30 seconds to go, I will stand up. With 10 seconds to go, I will walk slightly threateningly towards the presenter. And then at zero seconds, I'll start clapping. You'll all join in and then the person will go and sit down. Then the next person will come on and we'll hopefully get through as uh, in as close to half an hour as possible. The, the main poster session is tomorrow at one o'clock. So uh, lunch starts at half 12. I'm sure you've seen all the posters around the, uh, the refreshments area. Uh, so from one o'clock, the presenters will be standing at their posts to, to answer in-person questions. Uh, voting is via Slido. Uh, you've, presumably you've been on the Slido so far. One of the rooms is called Poster Voting, and you can ask a, a you can vote your favorite poster there. Yes, if you're a poster presenter, you can push to the front of the queue and say, I'm a poster presenter. Okay, so without further ado, I will invite the first presenter tomorrow to the stage and we will get started. Thank you. Uh, can I have my slide? Yes. Uh, near real-time weather forecasting, also known as nowcasting, is the provision of weather forecasts on a very short time scale, typically one to several hours. Uh, and this is really useful in Africa where uh, you can have very rapid development of intense storm activity at certain times of the year. So I've been involved in a project with researchers at the University of Leeds um, seeking to make available now casting information to users in Africa via a mobile application um, that everyone can access. Uh, so we started off with some original research code um, prototyped in Python and um, have built up a workflow that allows this information to be, um, satellite data to be uh, downloaded, translated into a suitable geographically spatially explicit format, stored into a database, made available to a mobile application front end. Um, and this has been released to users in Kenya and uh, is currently, we're currently prototyping, uh, developing it for other African countries. This is the first time for many African countries that now casting uh, information has been made available in this way. Um, so my poster is about the challenges that I came across um, going from this original prototype code into a, a live mobile application that uh, does display information about uh, current weather conditions in, in Africa. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie. Hi, um, my name is Stephanie Reuter um, and my post is called Fairy Wands with Fusion. Um, so what we are trying to do is make data magically appear um, because usually if you want to have data that is produced on site, transferred to the supercomputer, you have a large file and it usually takes a long time, but usually you only need a subset of that big file. So what we're trying to do is to just have an an option to just say, okay, request just this data set and just transfer it via the wide area network, which is where the name comes from. And despite it all, I'm not a fairy, even after all this work, but it just fits the title. Um, how we do that and what our results are, come see the poster. Hello, my name is Warwick Ball, um, and I have brought along a poster on the Journal of Open Source Software. Um, so I started a, I'm a, a subject editor for the astronomy and space physics uh, track. And I started a conversation about how many RSEs may already publish 
uh, articles in Joss, and somehow that means that I'm now here with a poster, and if you have questions, you can ask me. So if you don't already know about the Journal of Open Source Software, um, or Joss, it publishes short articles about research software, so normally about two pages, um, but the review process also includes reviewing the software uh, and looking for good software practice within it. So uh, in some ways, aspirational for researchers, and researchers can say, ah, maybe my software, I can try to make my software good enough uh, to go into Joss, and it also gives you a kind of citable artifact. You can then go through time and people will say, ah, I use such and such a piece of software, and they can cite uh, the relevant Joss paper. It's intended to be very developer friendly. So if you already have a fairly well fleshed out software package, certainly if you have uh, good documentation and API documentation and even um, automatic testing, then we think it should take you something like an hour to prepare the paper uh, to submit to Joss. So, you know, do so in your own projects and when you work with researchers. Also, if you are interested in reviewing for Joss, um, you can go ahead and register on the website. But if you'd like to know anything else, come and ask, uh, yeah, come and ask me at the poster or any other time that you see me around. Thanks. Uh, is it Prakyat or Milo who's presenting? Thank you. Hey, thanks very much. Um, right, I'm going to briefly mention then the fair sharing assistant. Uh, but before I can say what that is, I need to say what uh, fair sharing is, indeed what fair is. Um, I'm very pleased to see fair principles mentioned a couple of times already today. That is that result, uh, data from research products should be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Now, how at fair sharing do we attempt to promote that? Well, what we've done is produced a large um, directory of resources that uh, researchers may wish to use in helping to make their work fair. Uh, these are databases, standards, policies, and so on. For example, uh, databases might be listed where they could upload their data and get a persistent identifier or standards that they could follow or policies set by a particular journal. The problem we have, though, is that people often come to us saying, uh, right, such and such a journal told me I must make my data fair uh, following their policy and to look at fair sharing, but I can't see a button to upload my data. What do I do? And so we thought we'd produce an additional separate website uh, using our API, which is the Fair Sharing Assistant, more of a wizard with some simple questions such as, I think one of them on the front page now is, I have some data I need to upload, what do I do next? They should click these and be sent through various um, other questions and directed to educational resources or places where they can search for resources that may meet their requirements. So it's very much a work in progress. We're getting a lot of well, starting to get a lot of feedback from the community about what they want and making various changes. I think that's it then. Thank you. Uh, Jack? Hello, I'm Jack. I work with Daphne. Uh, if you don't know what Daphne is, it is a platform for national infrastructure research. Researchers can upload their data sets to our platform. Uh, they can run software models on it uh, in what we call workflows, and they can publish uh, publish and visualize the, uh, the results, and they can share all of those with whoever they want. Um, so currently, we use Minio, which is an S3 storage system, and to run data in a workflow, you need to upload the data to our internal stores. This takes a long, this can take a long time with large data sets, and sometimes it leads to people trying to do trying to trim down and use smaller data sets, which then can lead to, lead to uh, duplicated data, which we would want to avoid. And so, to overcome this, we are going to um, look towards allowing external data sources. And whenever someone wants to run a workflow, they can, instead of providing a data set and uploading it, they can provide filters and a link to, a, to an external data store. We will download that information based, download that data based on those filters, we will cache what they do, and then if they use those filters again with that with that external soul, we will use the cache. And that way we don't have to download every single time and that will keep everything much faster. Um, that's it. I know it's this one. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that's my slide. Um, hello, so I am Paul Richmond. I am the engineering lead of ICCS, that is the Institute of Computing for Climate Science. 
So we are a domain-focused research software engineering group operating internationally. We support a program called VESRI, and this is a Schmidt Futures funded, so it's a charitably funded uh, set of institutes. It's the Virtual Earth Science Research Institute program that they fund. There's a number of them around the world, and the ICCS works to support them and embed good software engineering practice. So the kind of the context as to why is obviously the Earth is warming up. This this wonderful kind of set of warming stripes gives a wonderful indication of just what a terrible job we're doing of looking after our planet. And the general scientific consensus for this is, you know, that's it's not a good thing, right? Um, just just in case you're in any doubt. Um, so so what ICS. ICCS does, I still can't say it, it's been like eight months, I still can't say it, um, is, is we bring all of these different kind of uh, technical skills together. So mathematics, computer science, software engineering, ML, data science, high performance computing. And we, we kind of bring all of those different skills together within our RSE team and embed them within the different uh, teams that, that Schmidt Futures uh, fund. So although they're kind of broadly covering climate science, they kind of have their own kind of domain and specialism, whether it be uh, kind of multi-scale machine learning, uh, land ecosystem model modeling, um, data waves or, or scale aware uh, kind of sea ice modeling. We kind of operate by embedding RSEs within those in international teams and supporting them to improve the software. It turns out that climate science, just as every other scientific field, is desperate for research software engineering support. And that's that's kind of what we do. So there are some other interesting things that we do. There are some challenges that we face operating internationally. Uh, and if you're interested in finding out more about those, then come on to our poster and have a chat. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I thought no one is going to talk about machine learning, but yeah, <laughs> that, that was cool. Um, so I'm Parminder and I'm from Health Informatics Center from University of Dundee. Um, and my poster is about how can we design a machine learning experiment uh, using Slurm within a, a cloud TRE. So some of you might know what a cloud TRE is. So TRE is more about a, a secure platform, which uh, which can be used to provide researchers uh, sensitive de-identified data to do their um, healthcare data or any other data uh, which they can use to do analysis. And this data does not go out of this platform. Now, uh, traditionally, most of the TRE providers have on-prem, all-time uh, on uh, mechanisms uh, and service. But recently, with machine learning and more adaptive uh, workloads, uh, most of these providers have been moving on to um, what's a more of a cloud-based uh, adaptive on-demand system. So what we have come up with is how can we use uh, a setup which can use a traditional slurm within a cloud theory. And then uh, my poster explains in detail more about how can uh, a routinely collected data set can be used to see uh, as a case study. So here you can quickly see that we get quite drastically reduced run times if we use a traditional slurm uh, within a, a HIC TRE. Thank you very much. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Saranjit uh, and I am presenting my work on shaping the landscape of the RSC Asia community. Uh, we initiated in 2021. And uh, as any system change, this has been a very slow uh, change to adopt. Uh, we started with the Open Life Science Program, uh, which is now called Open Seeds. Uh, and uh, we hosted our first uh, unconference in collaboration with RSC Australia last year. And we also plan to host another one this year. Uh, this year, we uh, fortunately got uh, support from the Research Software Alliance and uh, we are advocating uh, about research software on different established platforms within Asia Pacific. And also we plan to uh, leverage the network to uh, identify some local champions uh, within Asia who could help advocate about research software in this region. Uh, if you are interested to know more, uh, find me, uh, talk to me. I will also be at the RSC Worldwide session. Thank you.
Uh, hi, my name's Susan Kruger from the University of Dundee's Health Informatics Centre. Our poster looks like this. It presents the Scottish Medical Imaging or SMI platform and service, which makes or gives access to population level research ready medical images routinely collected since 2010 and linked to other data. So routinely collected or real world medical images are extremely helpful and useful in healthcare research, but they're very large and they're also quite messy. So we had three research questions, how to build research relevant cohorts from that messy, unstructured, identifiable data, how to handle big data in a scalable way, and how to protect patient confidentiality. Finding and sorting images to answer a given research question requires quite complex cohort building at times. And we derive the uh, descriptions of the data in three ways. From the metadata or the tags attached to the images, from the free text clinical um, notes and observations in the structured reports and from the pixel data itself. And then we need to make sure, of course, that there's no information remaining in the images that might identify an individual. So those three things together um, allow us to do, like I said, complex cohort building. For instance, here's a scenario. If we were to have this, um, this request, uh, we can link the data together using the Scottish Community Health Index or CHI number. Here we start with the Scottish population, bring that down to meet the diagnosis and maybe the age range, who has CTs and x-rays with lung nodules mentioned in the report. And so we end up with a lovely set uh, of a lot of images that are quite relevant to the topic. Come along to my, and thanks to the sponsors. That's me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, I'm uh, Andrew Brooks from the uh, University of Edinburgh, EPCC, and um, uh, following on from Susan's description of the SMI service, I'm talking about one of the research um, components of that done as part of the Pictures Project um, that had two research questions, how to safely provide radiology reports to the researchers whilst protecting, protecting patient confidentiality, and how to catalogue and index the text in the reports to enable the building of cohorts for finding reports or the images that uh, they are associated with. So the first part of that was the de-identification of the reports. Um, so these reports accompany the CT, MRI, ultrasound images uh, written by clinicians with the observations that, uh, from the image and, um, and possibly also some patient history in there as well. Um, they come in a DICOM uh, container format um, in a structured report, but uh, the actual free text isn't structured in any useful way. Um, so a major part of this was um, deciphering the peculiarity of all of the reports at a national scale, which is not just technical uh, details, but also the different ways that uh, clinicians might write things. Um, to identify all the different classes of personally identifiable information and to make sure that we don't redact anything that might be useful. So, for example, the um, disease name uh, should be left in there. Uh, and then finally, to redact the um, original DICOM file. And then the second part of the work was to provide a catalogue um, by um, uh, classifying all of the concepts for body parts, diseases, symptoms, treatments, and so on, even though they might be written in different ways. Um, uh, we've got a Postgres database with all the concepts in it. So we have a searchable web interface to it as well. <laughs> uh, Hi, I'm um, Phil Appleby. I'm also from the, uh, it's getting boring this, isn't it, from the Health Informatics Centre of the University of Dundee. Um, I'm here to talk about Carrot CDM, which is just an open source software tool. It doesn't have quite have the same broad sweep that we've had of the uh, from the posters so far. It's just one piece of software, which to my mind, 
sits right at the heart of a um, rabbit name themed um, ecosystem for mapping data partner data. We've, we've you've probably heard about this in, in, in various other talks to the OMOP CDM, the, the, the OMOP common data model. OMOP is observational medical now I've got that wrong already. Anyway, it's a common data format for, for medical data um, in which the co both codes and objects are defined. Um, one of the main things about this is data partner data resides in silos at data partner sites and Carrot CDM must operate remotely as far as I'm concerned. So when I, when I do my testing, I have to test on synthetic data before we deliver the software via PyPy to data partners to allow them to convert to a common data format, which means it can be queried via uh, the HDR innovation gateway. And that's about it really. Hi everyone, uh, I'm João Murado. I'm here to present our poster titled uh, Automating Data Flows in the Era of Big Data with the Pipeline. So uh, the Pipeline is a Python package created uh, through collaboration between the RSC team and the Marine Systems Modeling Group at the National Oceanography Center. The initial aim of this project was to develop uh, a software that would be capable of uh, automatically archiving and at the same time sharing uh, near present day reanalysis data sets because these data sets due to their relevance to the current time uh, they must be released as soon as possible so that they become publicly available to other researchers so with this in mind we developed this uh, package which aims to be as uh, versatile and customizable as possible um, it um, was designed uh, uh, at its core, it has a extract transform load pattern, uh, but uh, in the future, uh, we um, intend to incorporate uh, more complex, like uh, more uh, complex uh, graph-like workflows, so that people can do um, more uh, fancy uh, data pipelines. So it uh, is written in Python, as I said, it offers a um, common line interface and an API and some of its current features uh, include um, trigger, uh, monitor or monitoring of file system events that, that trigger the, the pipeline, streamlining of uh, data sets in parallel and offering various uh, functions uh, that is the processing and the transfer of data sets to cloud storage, among other capabilities. So if you are interested in knowing more about uh, this work or have any questions, please uh, come and talk with me. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Janetta Stein. I'm from Newcastle University. Um, some of you might have attended some uh, SSI collaborations workshop in the past. If you have, you'll know one of the sessions is usually you have to identify a problem and then in a group you discuss uh, possible solutions. And this is how Carpentries Offline came about. Uh, we were addressing the problem of running uh, Carpentries workshops when there is very little or no internet access. And so far we've come up with three solutions. Now I brought a bit of show and tell. So in the first instance, we uh, are preparing an, an SD card which gives you, which boots this Pi into a server, which will give you all the learning materials, uh, also all the downloads by R, Python R modules, and also Git, which is a replacement service for GitHub. Um, but sometimes um, Pies can be hard to get, as some of you might know during COVID, they could, couldn't get them at all. And um, we came up with a second solution, which is a SD, um, a flash drive that you can boot your computer from. So you do a USB boot and it does pretty much the same, turns your laptop into a server, which uh, has all these materials available. And lastly, after suffering through an HPC workshop earlier this year, where everything that could possibly go wrong did, um, 
we came up with a solution, which is a mini HPC um, that uh, built from Raspberry Pis, but it could be very difficult to build this yourself. So what we want to do is to create yet another SD card that turns this red node into the main node and makes it easier to um, add uh, uh, other nodes to, to it and that can be used for training and so forth. And if you want to know more, please come to our poster and we have the hackathon tomorrow morning. So, so, hello everyone. My name is Tobias and present today uh, Metocean Data System for South Atlantic, uh, Oceanon.live. So, I work in this project when I was working for Brazil Marine Meteorological Service. It's, it is the official service for weather forecast in South Atlantic. As you can see here, South Atlantic is huge and they need real time data for calibration, validation of oceanographic and, and weather models. Uh, although we have a lot of data collected, not all of the data is, is made public for having access. So in the end, we, we will not have data for validation calibration of ocean model. So the solution, I build a system to that go to different websites, um, uh, institutions, email, uh, international databases, and put it on a database. So I convert the data uh, quality control, and now I, the data can be available to the public by an API, so scientists can access this data uh, through the API. And also all the societies can access the data by a website. So although this is a private project, so it's not to open the website, sorry, <laughs> but although it's a private, pro a, a private pro project, now it's open source and all the Brazilian societies can use this website. So... Uh, if you want to uh, contribute to the project, please let me know if you have any doubts. So, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jason Chow. Uh, I would like to talk about um, building operational web-based research tools using free cloud-hosted Jupyter Notebook. Um, so uh, in December last year, I got a request from one of my colleagues and she wanted to get um, frames extracted from um, YouTube, uh, sorry, um, TikTok videos that she was studying. And she also wanted to extract audio tracks from those, uh, um, the audio tracks from those videos. And she wanted to have those audio tracks transcribed into text. Um, well, for us, extracting uh, well an audio track from videos or um, sampling frames uh, from video is, is pretty easy and straightforward. You can just use an open source tool like FFmpeg. Um, but for people um, from diverse technical backgrounds, or particularly those who do not have a strong technical background, using a command line tool could be very complicated. In a same thing um, as in, in the very same thing um, as us um, finding a low level library is difficult to use as developers. So uh, so I managed to use a free cloud based Jupyter notebook to develop it to, uh, to develop two tools, um, video frame extractor and um, speech to task converter. And I managed it to deliver um, it within six days in December last year. And and the process uh, and how capturing the requirements, coding, testing, and making changes in three iterations. Uh, please check out my poster if you're interested. Thank you very much. Well, we made it uh, in about half an hour, so that was uh, very good. So another big round of applause to all the presenters for, for keeping such excellent time.